Average real interest rates were 2%. Yeah. 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 So people, what, my, com, people talk about low interest rates. My point is that don't be fearful of a normalization of bond yields and interest rates. Oh, because it's been the actually, best thing that's happened um, to my investment we, career. We need to yeah. turn on the pod for this because this is, we, we're, this we're is running, exactly what we're running. running. Mm-hmm. But, um, but, but when we get yeah, started. John and I, I mean, yeah. we, we, again, 2000, mm-hmm. 2010, mm-hmm. The US virtually went sideways, which yes. again is the bias. Mm. Our, our bias yeah. is mm-hmm. actually UK equities can do as well as the US, yes. but that was in a funny period. Yeah, where it was a funny period. We, again, it was a funny period. Yeah, we need to get over it, John. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, 2000 to 2003 was not a good period for the US as the dot com no. bubble mm. burst. No. Um, good, well, we'll make a start, shall we? Right, good. Yeah, uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Taking Stock After the Bell, uh, episode 27. Joined as always by James Hughes. Uh, investment manager, and thrilled to be joined by uh, Alan McIntosh, uh, a little biography here for him. Um, mm. Alan serves as the Chief Investment Strategist and Acting Chief Investment Officer at Quilt Achievia. Uh, his role encompasses several key responsibilities, including equity strategy, chairing the asset allocation committee, and sitting on various other sub-investment committees across the firm. Before joining Quilt Achievia, Alan was a founding partner at Achievia Asset Management, where he held the position of Chief Investment Officer. Uh, his experience also includes roles at Lang and Crookshank Investment Management and Credit Suisse Asset Management before that. Uh, Alan graduated with an honours degree in economics from Heriot Watt University, uh, is a keen an- amateur astronomer and lover of 1970s prog rock. Oh, yes. Big fan of those. <laughs> <laughs> Big fan of Fantastic. Those. Very, different from, uh, very different from last week's cohort who wouldn't know what prog rock was, quite, but uh, uh, quite, I do. Quite, quite, quite Alan, welcome. Thank you. Delighted um, to be here. A few more weeks and then mm-hmm. setting off into the retirement sunset. Yes, yes, yes. So 42 years of uh, helping um, people make money in investments. Yep. And uh, I think time to hang my boots up. And I have plenty of energy, but I'm not going to carry on helping the financial services. So mm. I will use that energy in a different direction. Oh, good, good. And you finally seen Japan... Yes, great, great well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I remember that was the time to retire. In 1989, <laughs> when it hit its 39,000 and a bit on the Nikkei, and it's taken, what, um, yeah, 30, 30, odd years. 30 odd years yeah. to get back there. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, amazing, <laughs> amazing, yeah. Um, well, why don't we start off then, Alan? Mm-hmm. I was quite intrigued about your sort of early <clears throat> career in the 80s. Yeah. What did that look like, and what was what was your like? You didn't have emails. I mean, this is no, mind blowing no, stuff, no. right? Telephones and faxes. Yeah, and so our market information was um, a, a setup called Topic, which was provided by the stock exchange. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, you until 1984, when the the FTSE 100 mm-hmm. actually launched. Yeah. I mean, you had the FT30, and you could scroll through the all share mm-hmm. index. Um, you could get some overseas data, but the interesting thing, so, you know, let's go back to the beginning. So I <clears throat> started my investment career in August 1982 as a trainee U.S. fund manager at Scottish Life oh, in wow. Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. And it was one of these things, it was just good luck. I, mm. I had a degree in economics, I was interested in investments, mm. I, my... Um, dissertation was on efficient markets was it uh, yeah and so I was already interested yeah. although the first mistake I made when I um, went to my interview Scottish Life I said they said you know well what have you been what, why are you interested in investments mm. I said well I did a big project on efficient market hypothesis and he said and what was the conclusion I said well it's absolutely true you can't pick stocks <laughs> and they said, so why, why are you here I said Ah, but the, there is a, there there is an extreme view that you can, and, uh, and I kind of tried to talk my way out of that one. But I thought, well, but first full path, uh, so I'm not going to not going to pursue that route ever it's again. This guy Jack Bogle, yeah. well, thank God. Yeah. So it was interesting times because we'd only just basically been given the green light to invest overseas. If you cast your mind back to nineteen seventy nine, yeah, days, right? so. When Mrs. Thatcher was elected in 1979, one of the first things, I think it was Nigel Lawson as our chancellor, was um, to remove um, exchange controls Mm. and the dollar Mm. premium. So previously you had to pay 
a premium to invest outside of the UK. Right. Yep. And so most investment departments were expanding their overseas. So we took on someone mm. to cover Japan and someone else to cover the US. So I got the US. My friend, uh, who was actually also on the same economics course, mm. um, got the Japan job. So mm. we were pretty chuffed that oh, we brilliant. both got yeah, yeah, yeah. You job. were slightly lucky having the US and Japan, though, with the benefit of well, hindsight. absolutely. <laughs> and so my initial... Um, you know, kind of role was literally, there were hundreds of companies coming mm. through, US companies coming through Edinburgh, because they knew that suddenly they were tapping mm. into a totally fresh uh, investor base. Mm. That was quite and a big fund management community, wasn't it? it massive, I mean, Standard Life were the biggest. Yeah. Um, but so there were the life companies down at St. Andrew's Square, end of um, Princess Street, and then the kind of the Bailey Giffords, the Martin Currys, uh, the Charlotte Square, they were at the posh mm. end. Oh, yeah. Uh, they were at the new town end, and we were at the kind of slightly shabby end, down heading towards Leith Docks. You know, so it's. Uh, um, but it was, and there was a bit of rivalry there, but uh, it was fun times. But interesting. So when I started, there was actually um, a tech bubble going on in the U.S. market. It was loads and loads of IPOs. It was nothing like the dot com bubble, but it was a whole mini kind of tech thing, and it was more about chips, chip technology, um, but. Loads of companies came through town, and uh, it was it was a great experience because uh, you're just getting exposure to lots of really smart people. Mm. And then there were the conventional companies coming through. And I remember meeting, um, so a few of us kind of started, um, you know, kind of straight after graduation. And I met my counterpart who was working for Standard Life. We were at a, a lunch meeting for the company, and we were exchanging notes. And this was literally my kind of first or second week. Mm. And he said, you know, what are you guys buying at the moment? And I said, well, we're flipping some of these IPOs. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, but what about your mainstream portfolios? I said, um, well, we've been buying this um, discount retailer called Kmart. And he said, oh, oh, right. And I said, but what's the problem? He said, well, we're buying the, the, the mainstream discount retailer called Walmart. Mm -hmm. And so I went back and spoke to my boss. And I said, it was interesting. I was chatting to a new colleague, friend, and he kind of looked a bit snoozy when we, he said, mm. I said, we're buying Kmart in there. And my boss, um, Ian McCallum, said, oh, no, everybody's buying Walmart. You know, we think this is the one that will really become, mm. you know, the, the winner. Six months later, went bankrupt. So the first lesson I learned was don't be too clever. Mm. You know, sometimes mm. good quality businesses <clears throat> that have been around for a while, they're around for a while mm. for a good reason, yeah. and they can compound. And Walmart, of course, went on to become, mm. and still is, probably the biggest retailer. The biggest retailer in the world. In, yeah. in the world. And so we were trying to be too cute by mm. picking a company that actually could get totally thrashed. By it was probably two handles cheaper on a P exactly, or something, or the dividend exactly, yield was half a point higher. Yeah. You know, so, and you thought, oh, we can buy this one because it's a I, discount. It, that informed me, and it, it made me think more about, well, trying to identify good companies and, and kind of holding on to them, mm. uh, which is something that, I mean, it's a kind of philosophy that we have at, at QC. Yep. You know, the team do try and yeah, have absolutely. a kind of quality growth bias. Not to say there are opportunities mm. elsewhere, but, mm. you know, if you want a kind of core portfolio that you can almost fit and forget, um, you know, those, those sorts quality, of names yeah. usually, you know, will pay off in, in the long term. Um, so that was interesting. Um, I suppose the next big event which everyone talked about was um, the October 87 crash, mm. Mm. which was um, quite interesting because, and, and again, um, great story there because on that was October the 19th, Black Monday. So October the 16th, the previous Friday, there was a huge hurricane storm in yeah. the south of England. Yeah. Mm. It wasn't in UK wide because it wasn't in Scotland. That was the Michael Fish. That's there'll be exactly, no school, that's yeah. absolutely right. So when I went into work on the Friday morning, uh, by that time I was heading up the UK desk mm. at Scottish Life. So I couldn't get a hold of any brokers mm. in London because no, you couldn't no, get them to no work. No one was at the desk. Yeah. So, no, no, so no, anyway, no eventually a few of them um, came wandering in. Um, in the afternoon, Wall Street was off 3 or 4%. Mm. You know, there was no real hint of anything um, 
to come in the UK market had closed down. But anyway, I was on a Friday evening, we always went for a drink about five o'clock and I was still sitting at my desk about half past five. My phone went and it was my, one of my brokers from what was then Phillips and Drew, became UBS. And he said, look, I've just had a call from our US desk and he said, um, they can offer you half a million ICI. That was a company then mm. in the FTSE. Half a million ICI at five percent below the London close, and we had a load of cash flow coming in because at mm. that time there was huge just allocations to equities. These know, were was, pen, pension fund money pension mainly. funds, and our life fund was life also. Fund, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they were you know boosting their equity. Yeah, the opposite. Of I was going to say there's, today. A, there's a lesson there. Somewhere. Total opposite <laughs> of what's happening today. And so I had money to burn. So I said, okay, I'll I'll take that. And um, then, of course, Monday came and the U.S. market opened down and closed down 22 percent, which is the largest one day fall. Um, What I did, because we got a sense that the U.S. market was going to open sharply lower. Mm. So the first thing I did was go on to my broker and said, can you cut that position Mm. now? And I took a loss on it. Mm. And I, I got bit of a kicking from my boss but mm. lesson number two never buy any stock last thing on a Friday oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. because you have no idea what can happen over the next 48 yeah. hours bad stuff can happen and there was obviously yeah. a reason yeah. someone was dumping the stock at a descent yeah. to the London close and people to this day don't really know what triggered the 87 crash no. there was a flick up what I do remember is the US was running twin deficits budget deficit and trade deficit and believe it or not you'd laugh now but they were both about four percent of GDP now that's normal it's nothing Mm. Um, but it pushed bond yields up quite sharply there must have been a bit of a buyer strike Mm. an auction on the Mm. Friday and that move up in the bond yields was enough to trigger a correction but the market had been on a tear earlier in the year so it wasn't as if Ironically, even though that was a 20% fall and the UK closed 10% down on the the Friday afternoon and then opened up another 10% down on the Monday. So it was Mm -hmm. down 20% but spread over two days. Um, It still closed up by the end of the year. Such had been the... Because the market was up 40% into it, wasn't it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's probably a good time. We've got... um, I didn't really know what charts to put up, Mm -hmm. so I just did a chart of MSCI World since uh, since the end of 79. So this is 44 years. So this kind of encapsulates most of your career. It it really does. And and the one thing that struck (coughs) me, Jonathan, when you showed me that chart yesterday, Mm. was if if you look at the first 20 years, so the 80s and the 90s, how... Well, the slope of that curve is, mm. is Very steep. higher yeah. than the subsequent 20 years. And I, I did some checking, and over that 20-year period, the U.S. stock market averaged just over 17% per annum. That's extraordinary return. number. And that was a time when real interest rates averaged about 2%. They were obviously a lot higher than they were mm. now. And inflation was certainly 2%, 3% volatile higher at the beginning of the period uh, and heading down as the period ended. But I think what I take comfort from is when everyone's worried about the new regime where interest rates look more similar Mm. to where we were pre-financial crisis and real interest rates may be positive. So even if inflation gets down towards two, you may see bond yields and short rates three or four, yeah. mm. don't be fearful because companies can adapt to that. Mm. And it's more about stability. Um, so I'm not at all worried that we cannot get good returns from equities uh, in that post GFC world. Agree. What's been painful is the transition from zero rates yeah, to absolutely. where we are now. Yeah, yeah. Are they, are they're saying that <clears throat> this morning. I and mean, I was in a client meeting mm. this morning and, and <clears throat> if you sort of look at the, keep talking, the peak in December 21 mm-hmm. to basically today's two years yeah. and portfolios are sort of back probably just above sort of there or thereabouts mm-hmm. to where they were two years ago. Yeah. Now had you said to me during that period that inflation would round trip from two to twelve yeah. <laughs> yes. and yeah, interest yeah, rates yeah. were going from naught to five and a half percent and will still be there, I yeah. would have said the damage yeah. would have been a lot worse. Absolutely. Um, it's it's so quite remarkable. 22 wasn't a great year by no. any stretch but it, you know you put it in that sort of context yeah. and it's not been too bad. But uh, And it is beginning to fade 
you know, out of the numbers. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, you know, it will still be a scar for people's memories mm -hmm. for, for a few years because, you know, had they, this slightly unusual situation where both, you know, bonds and equities were poor store, stores of value. Yeah. But as, as I say, there's plenty of time to get that back. But you're right, though. I mean, during that period of the 80s and the 90s, bond yields were well into kind of high single digits, yeah. weren't they? Even, you yeah. know, the, the dot com, which we'll come on to talk mm, about. Yes. During the speculative mania of dot com, mm -hmm. you could get 7% on the US Treasury. Yeah, absolutely. So it's absolutely. not, you know, the, the 2020, 2021 period yeah. of, of sort of bubble like behavior that we sure. had in certain areas mm. was in part driven by low rates. But actually, yeah. it wasn't, you know, you could kind of um, see how that might not be the case. Mm. But, um, so when, I mean, what was your sort of recollections of the 90s then kind of leading into dot com? And I guess the inevitable question is um, any sort of similarities to where we stand yeah, today? Yeah, interesting, I mean, isn't I'm it? Because the, the, there are similarities, but I don't think parallels. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that coming into the kind of dot com bubble, and, and this was all about the Internet, to be perfectly honest. and. Sure, there was a huge amount. Again, there was plenty of capital to be deployed. Markets mm. were buoyant. Uh, people were, you know, feeling very optimistic. And, you know, it was really just uh, a seller's market. You know, the stock's coming to IPO. That anything, you just called it something, something, dot com. Dot com and, you know, you expect it to get a yeah. fantastic multiple. Mm. I think the difference then and we can talk about magnificent seven and other tech stocks now and whether there is an analogy i mean a lot of these companies were not profitable mm -hmm. they were con concept blue sky we knew about the internet we didn't really know how pervasive it would be in terms of people's lives mm -hmm. um, but it was definitely going to be the next big thing and it was quite interesting because I think where there is a parallel, so valuation is a different thing because yeah. Yeah. E even the profitable companies were sitting on stratospheric yeah. Yeah. multiples. Cisco, and, and, Microsoft. Yeah. Ah, right. Some, okay. Some so, so Cisco is the case in point. So mm. Cisco was the stock that everybody owned because we could not identify who the potential winners would yeah. be uh, on this kind of fledgling industry. But you know, if you bought the company that supplied the plumbing. They were, you know, supplying every company mm. who wanted to aspire into um, online um, and internet related businesses. And it was a little bit like, you know, don't, don't buy, you know, if there's a gold rush, don't buy shares mm. in mining companies, buy the company that makes picks and shovels. Picks and, shovels yeah. and so that's why everybody bought Cisco. Yeah. Now, Cisco went to a stratospheric multiple oh. share price echoes that of NVIDIA mm. over the last three or four years, up to like 400%. Mm. Um, but we all owned it and it was profitable. So it was a bit of a no-brainer mm. until it no longer had its competitive advantage and it's still about 90% below its peak <laughs> in 2000. So the, the, I suppose the, the question is a, a company like NVIDIA that clearly has a competitive advantage, probably for another couple of years, mm. has until it no longer has. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's also the kind of Nokia versus Apple type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be yeah. careful that it probably is fine for now, but even people like um, you know AMD are saying, you know, we've developed a smarter yeah. chip. Supply comes along so to satisfy mm. demand. I, it's a question of when to get off the, the merry-go-round. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, we, we've got a chart of Cisco here. We might just yeah. get that, Alex, popped in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the pack um, yeah. to show where you can see the stratospheric rise there yeah. in 2000. And you're right, it's still well below where it was. Yeah, I, so NVIDIA probably you could, well, you, you can't extrapolate it into the future, mm. but it, you can probably map one over the other in yeah. terms yeah. of the... Yeah, I've seen that before. It's pretty close. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now NVIDIA's grown into its multiple. Yeah. Well, so that I mean, that's the amazing thing. I, yeah. don't, I don't know what Cisco multiple was back mm -hmm. then, but I'm assuming... Uh, 200 six, times or yeah. something. Yeah, so it is, it is a different... Because it was the only opportunity. It was yeah, the only okay. stock to buy. Yeah. And yeah. It, yeah. it was the most crowded trade mm. in the market. And, of course, we all forgot to sell it. <laughs> so, when, yeah. so basically yeah. from 2001 to three, when the... the you know, that absolutely blew up. Um, 
you know, it was a complete nightmare. Mm. The, the corollary of that is because I wasn't really a tech fan. Were you still running US money at this point? I was, no, I was, I was on the UK right. desk in the mm. late, uh, in, around 2000. And what I would observe was everyone was selling old economy stocks and buying new economy mm. stocks. I think at the time, um, there were 11 TMT stocks in the FTSE 100. BT and Vodafone were the biggest two. Yeah, presumably. but there were a whole load of stuff that never hadn't made a penny and right. they were IPO'd and they just went straight into the FTSE. So you knew alarm bells. Yeah. It wasn't my yeah, specialist, yeah, but yeah. you just knew this is way, way beyond frothy. Hmm. But I remember between, I think, two, I think 1998 and 2000, the Unilever share price fell by two thirds. They'd never had a profit warning, but it was just people were selling out of yeah. these old economy stocks yeah. and buying tech stocks. And it was the biggest buying opportunity in old economy yeah. stocks. And the yeah. tobaccos. And and yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we have, we're not, we're not quite, we're not seeing that to the same extent now, but no. you are, that yeah, the, the, the yeah, older sectors are certainly trading on yeah. pretty big discounts, but yeah. not, not so extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, I, th- I suppose, to now draw the comparison with, you know, tech stocks today mm. and the particular Magnificent Seven, that well, I think Tesla's mm. probably no longer a candidate. I mean, it's it's a different business mm. and it's, it's dynamic is different. You know, they've decided to go, you know, to buy market share by mm. cutting prices. Mm. Have they destroyed yeah. what was a prestige brand mm. to discuss? But it's a different type of company, even if it has tech capabilities it's yeah. basically yeah. Yeah. well it's still a manufacturer makes cars ultimately exactly. which is an inherently low margin business. yeah so <clears> you know <throat> let, let's focus on the others who you know very profitable businesses that generate a lot of free cash flow and they can reinvest that cash flow and good returns on invested capital i'm comfortable with that mm. the multiple is less important than how incrementally they get a return on the capital employed and as long as they can demonstrate that, then I'm happy mm. with that. And I think, you know, we know earnings is a residual and you can yep. come up with zero earnings like Amazon mm. and look on a huge multiple. They, they could change the way they account and it could be on 20 times. And well, a few businesses have done that, haven't they, in the last yeah. few years? There's yeah. been a few so, sort of about turns. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's, you know, what incremental value they get from every pound of invested capital. And are they, how much free cash flow are they generating? And and these businesses have almost become staples, haven't they? Because mm. you know they're they're interest rate <clears throat> insensitive. In fact, higher rates have helped them because they're They've getting cash on the balance cash sheet. On the balance sheet. <laughs> so they're they're almost yeah. impervious yeah. to macro. Yeah. As long as what about um, kind of this regulation monopoly power? Yeah. Story. That that is always a risk. Interestingly, that's been around for at least a decade. Yeah. Mm. And in the EU in particular. Really, no. yeah. Okay, the Apple fine. The Apple fine yesterday. Actually, what is it, 0.5%? Yeah, it's half percent of the stock. Mm. Google have been under the spotlight for a few years in Europe, but they've not really managed to pin them yeah. down at all. But is there a sort mm. of, I guess, is there a risk that there may be a Trump administration if that were to pass? Or the US regulated yes, the time? Yes, however, uh, much as one may dislike Trump, he's savvy enough to know that he's not going to kibosh all his domestic These are nas- national champions now, aren't they? Yeah, so why would he... You well, know, they are an in sort of an in, in, you know, an IP um, yeah. battle with China. Yes. They're not going to destroy their national no, champions correct. when they're in a technology war, Co- really. Correct. Um, the other thing I find interesting, though, is what's going on with um, AI and... You know, you've got Elon Musk suing OpenAI, or is it Microsoft? I'm not sure. Stand because the, 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 and this is interesting, you've also got the, the Writers Guild in the US suing because they've yeah. used... Yeah, their images. You know, and their, yeah. They're mm-hmm. not just images. So yeah, uh, you've got Getty Images. But, mm-hmm. you know, they've used copyrighted material mm-hmm. for these large language um, models to learn from. So, you know, if you want to go into chat GBT and say, I want to write this article in the style of John Grisham, how does it know how to write in the mm. style of John mm. Grisham? Mm. And, and so this is a genuine potential, uh, you know, lawsuits are going to be flying left, right and centre. So those yeah. that own proprietary content, mm. maybe like a Relax, 
Mm. Could be in a good position. Or like an investment management podcast series. <laughs> well, <laughs> indeed. So I, I find that interesting because th there is this, con I suppose, philosophical, that we're going, going slightly off piece, that the what, what um, Elon Musk is saying is that the latest chat GBT version that has yet to be um, released now um, has learning beyond the capability of humans. And we're now in the very dangerous point that if this is commercialized, mm. then there is a real human conflict of Potential. interest. Yeah. Mm. And one wonders to what extent some of the progress here gets, you know, gummed up in lawsuits and things like yeah. that. I don't know. I mean, but I, I don't think this is dot com bubble like 2000 to 2003. Um, I think the the concentration of some very, very large companies that are very profitable, mm. that have the resources to develop new t industries, I think is actually quite exciting. It, it feels potentially, you know, not that it feels a little mm. bit more nifty fifty to me, but not yes, quite. I think that's a handful a of stocks analogy. in the seventies: yeah. Coca Cola, IBM, Eastman Kodak, mm. McDonald's. Yeah, but they were all on 40, 45 times earnings. But they were all beneficiaries of consumerism mm. yes. and a trend. And, and those stocks, they didn't blow up. To be fair, they just no. went nowhere for ten years, yeah. right? Um, so if there's going to be mm -hmm. if there's going to be a kind of yeah. recompense for these magnificent seven or whatever you want to call it, that would be seems more of a mm -hmm. parallel to me yeah. than dot com. I remember um, in one of Terry Smith's letters that he said even if you bought the Nifty Fifty at its peak yeah. mm. and held them to today, you'd still have made you'd, you'd still, still done a right perform yeah. yeah. the S and P because they had a, a you'd have to suffer a lot of pain yeah, of course in mm, yeah. the ensuing yeah. kind of ten years, but eventually. Well, I think what's interesting is. Those companies actually delivered double the earnings of yep. the rest of the S and P, yep. but yes. the share prices went nowhere so, because you they, they had to yeah, fill so, into their yeah, own correct. multiples. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Um, um, and that, that sort of leads me on quite neatly, actually, to mm -hmm. to obviously 1980 to 2000 was yeah. a golden period for yeah. equity investing. I mean, it's fair to say that 2000 to 2010 was one of the worst decades for yeah. invest, mm -hmm. equity investors mm -hmm. ever yeah. post 29. Uh, unbelievable. You, 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 your hundred pounds in two thousand was mm -hmm. still a hundred pounds in two thousand and ten, and it had been to fifty twice along the way. Yeah, and mm -hmm. this was interesting because when I joined <clears throat> Scottish Life in nineteen eighty two, my older colleagues had been through the seventy three five yeah. market, mm -hmm. and the U UK market fell seventy three percent between nineteen seventy three and nineteen seventy five. Mm -hmm. So they'd been through something like that, and for those who were aware of that but never lived through it 2008 9 felt mm. that felt like what that must have felt yeah. to yeah. them in 73 5 and that was an interesting time as well because we set up um cheviot in 2006 how oh, did you yeah and uh so we were just kind of getting established and then <laughs> 2000 and eight nine lehman's happened mm. now i have a fascinating anecdote about that and again, it was a great learning experience because my chairman at the time was Sir George Matheson, who had just retired from being chair of RBS. Mm. He was still a consultant with Banco Santander, so he was still involved in the, mm. in the banking sector. So after Lehman's and then, you know, there was this kind of contagion effect in the banking sector. It was obviously under a lot of duress, but this was before the bailout mm. started. Mm. So he came in and he said, look, um, I remember, and he's kind of Scottish accent. Oh, well, you know, this is this is just a liquidity crisis. You know, it's nothing more than that. As long as the authorities <coughs> provide liquidity to the banking sector, it will be fine. No, it was a solvency mm, crisis. Yeah. And this was the big mistake. <coughs> Either the banks just didn't care or they just didn't know. And, and mm. whichever it was, they're culpable. But... You know, these MBSs, most of them were toxic. They, yes. just, yeah. they were yeah. worthless. And that's the bit they didn't get. That they were carrying stuff in their balance sheet yeah. that was worthless. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was a solvency. And as a result, you know, we held, we we're a big position in RBS, which mm. we hung on to. We sold everything else. But he said, oh, no, you shouldn't sell your Royal Bank of Scotland. It will look embarrassing because I'm the mm. chairman of your company. 
So, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a conflict of interest. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this. Now. Yeah, well, um, but, history now. Yeah, so that, that was another lesson learned, that people mm. you think should know inside out what's going on often don't. don't. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, so that is really interesting. My anecdote yeah. from that, and mm. I joined a startup, wealth mm. management business, in 2008, the summer of 2008. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't great timing. Yeah. I'm getting clients over an asset. Sure. The day that Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, Monday the 13th, I think it was, mm -hmm. we had Anthony Bolton into our office, oh, the right. most esteemed okay. UK yeah, fund manager yeah, there was. Yeah. Right? And you could hear a pin drop in the boardroom, mm -hmm. like I can picture this day, because he was talking about what was going on and mm -hmm. you know, FTSE was down X yeah. hundred points. Mm -hmm. And he said, because he wasn't managing money at that point, right. he was a sort of a spokesman mm -hmm. for, yeah. uh, for, for Fidelity. Fidelity yeah. And um, he sort of said, oh, do you know, I really miss days like this. I really wish I was managing money. And he said, HBOS today at £3.20 and Lloyd's, oh, I'd be tucking into some really? of those today. <laughs> and he was genuine. Yeah. You mm -hmm. could see that he just wanted to go and buy these things. Well, HBOS yeah. get taken over by Lloyd's and mm -hmm. the share price ended up falling another 90%. Yeah. So, you know, to come back to your point, yeah. people who probably should know by their yes. reputation, yeah, yeah, these absolutely. big hitters, mm -hmm. just got, you, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. totally wrong. Yeah. Um, the well, other thing I, I, again, having a background in economics and having been taught by monetarists, the Chicago School, the so Milton Friedman and his, well, no, I wasn't taught by Milton Friedman, but one of his colleagues who was in secondment from mm -hmm. Chicago Business School was teaching economics <coughs> at Harriet Watt. And so we were one of the last universities in the UK that was actually peddling this monetarist orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Thatcher bought into it as mm -hmm. well. Um, now, when quantitative easing started as a response to the banking crisis, so obviously rates went to zero very quickly, well, not as quickly enough, but eventually they went to zero and then the whole bond purchasing thing started. The, the, the cries of, um, you know, this is just going to generate hyperinflation, mm. they yeah. must be mad. Yeah. And <coughs> I kind of put my hand up and said, I don't think so. And uh, Kind of taken to task by that and the reason was because what you had then was a credit bust so money supply collapsed and the velocity of circulation collapsed so mm -hmm. you actually had a shrinking money supply which if nothing was done to stem that you would end up in depression mm -hmm. and this was one thing that ben bernanke sussed quite quickly and he was the key yeah. architect yeah. of the, he he was a, his big phd thesis was, thesis, was on, the, on japan uh, uh, great on depression 29 yeah. and, and, <clears throat> and the depression in the early 30s and he recognized the symptoms of this and so i always we didn't have a big research team or anything but you know i did the morning meetings and i said look the analogy is th think of a a bucket full of water and somebody's punched a hole in the bottom mm. of it, so the, wa the, the water's leaking out, you've got to keep topping it up, keep mm. topping mm. it up, and all it's doing, this pumping money into the system is just keeping the wheels turning. It's not actually going to be inflationary. <coughs> and it, it wasn't, uh, if anything, it, it, uh, it stopped deflation and mm. depression. Mm. The difference with, we can come on to the post-COVID response, yeah. Yeah. where we had the whole thing again, mm. um, this is going to be inflationary because we'd already had a huge amount of fiscal stimulus plus monetary stimulus. And I think com combination was roughly 35% of US GDP between March 2020 and yeah. December yeah. 2021. Unprecedented in modern history. Equivalent to the whole Marshall Plan to redevelop Europe post Second World War in 18 months. And the reason it was likely to be inflationary was that you were fueling demand, you had supply constraints, mm. and you were increasing the quantity of money and also the velocity of circulation. And mm. it had to feed through. It had nowhere else to go, mm. whether it was in asset prices or real goods prices. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, you know, all level economics, what is the definition of inflation? Too much money chasing too few goods. Mm -hmm. There was the perfect characterization. You had too much money chasing a constrained supply. Yeah. And that was an interesting response. But people shouldn't have been surprised that inflation went up. And mm -hmm. when they were saying this is transitory, no, until that whole quantum of money 
washes through the system and it's taken all this time yeah, yeah. and again i always kind of say when duncan used to say mm. you know the us is going to be in recession mm. because you can't go from zero to five in yeah. a bit percent mm. without breaking the economy I kept saying, no, actually, because the huge quantity of support that is still washing through, yeah, of course. companies have refinanced, yeah. Yeah. Uh, household balance sheets are strong, you're writing checks to individuals, and they, they can't spend it fast enough. There's nothing to spend it on. Mm. That will support the economy for a while. Um, so it's a very, very different set of circumstances. So with hindsight, QE was probably a mistake mm. post, as a post-COVID response. A fiscal response, fine. You know, if you want to protect your workforce, if you want to help people, um, and derive you know, businesses from going uh, absolutely yeah. Yeah. support the economy, because there are supply constraints on it. Fine, that's what fiscal uh, fiscal stimulus is there to do. That's what government inter intervention is there to do. I, I still think the monetary response was unnecessary, mm. and we wouldn't have had the rampant inflation that we had. But uh, anyway, as I say, it's just interesting that there are two periods where the the outcome of QE has been completely different, mm. but not many people understood why. Mm. And mm. Uh, anyway, that's that's by the by. So, uh, and do you then, think do you think there's enough? Do you think we've almost got through the danger point of those U.S. recessionary pressures? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. the The economy is. Strong, but not too strong. Mm. The house, the the prop, sorry, the labour market is still pretty strong. It's, yeah. it's weakening a little bit, but wage growth is abating a little bit. But mm. wage growth is still sufficient to keep standards of living quite yeah. high. Yeah. And, you, and I think it's yeah. it's a it's a happy coincidence. I don't mm. think anyone could have predicted we'd be where we are in terms of the U.S. economy. But one of the reasons uh, I've always been a big support of the US is, is a largely self-sufficient economy. Mm -hmm. They didn't mm -hmm. have the huge spike in inflation <coughs> caused by energy prices going no. up because they are self-sufficient no. in energy. They're actually the biggest producers of oil and gas in the world. Never mind OPEC, they are the US yep. is now. And you know, they, they even export. So they were exporting LNG to, to Europe to help mm -hmm. them out post Russia, Ukraine. So this rather self-sufficiency of the US economy. It's also a huge internal market and has the deepest pools of capital. So this idea that the dollar is finished and the US economy's prevalence is over, not in my They're lifetime. Bad, no. And now that China's rolling over. Yeah, I, I well, think. what are your sort of thoughts? We talked a little bit about in the pod about, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the peace dividend post-Cold War, yeah. kind of rolling back, mm -hmm. um, fracturing <coughs> globalization, yeah. West versus mm -hmm. East, mm -hmm. Russia, Ukraine, obviously, but China, Taiwan, yeah. potential flashpoints. I mean, your sort of thoughts that, like, obviously, our lifetimes, mm -hmm. James and I, mm -hmm. lifetimes yeah. and investing mm -hmm. in our resting careers mm -hmm. has been a, a peace dividend. Are we going yeah. into an era that's a little bit more dangerous, do you think? And, and, and I, I think so, sadly, <coughs> um, and a more unpredictable. And, and in a sense, it... it part of the consequences of global inequality. Yeah. I, I think, if anything, <clears throat> COVID, uh, the rich got richer. Those mm. with assets are even yeah, better 100%. off. Yeah. And you, you can find all sorts of data that said inequality is narrowing. I, I don't believe a word of it. The quantum of it is, or optically, um, that will <coughs> continue to create social um, un unrest globally. Mm. I think um, oh, there pop will be populism in the last ten years. Populism. There will be more protectionism. There will be de-risking. Call it de-risking rather than de-globalization. Mm -hmm. But that that is a phenomenon we've just got to learn to live with. And, I mean, and the world will f faction into mm. groupings, uh, economic political groupings. I mean, we're even starting to feel it in the UK, aren't we? In terms of relative salaries and yeah. um, you know the, the growth mm -hmm. that's been in the US, the sort of businesses that are listed in the UK, yeah. the opportunities, you know, the opportunity set of IPOs and secondaries just yeah. isn't here, and that's, it's that's unbelievably right. frustrating. It, it is. Um, it is. You can't. I, I don't really see that turning. No. Anytime soon, uh, unless you direct capital. But that's almost like going back to the yeah. pre-1979. Capital controls. You, you basically just channel investment into the UK. And I what mean, worries me is actually, um, you know, everybody's pension fund is going to be 
given an allocation to you know high risk mm. unquoted businesses. Mm. It, that's the aspiration. Mm. I'm not sure that's a good no, thing. I don't think it's a good thing either. No. I don't think so. I think that should be a government led thing. Yeah. You know, is is not for um, unwitting, mm. you know, retail investors to suddenly come the wrong end of a bad investment. And let's be honest, the government doesn't have a great track record in um, infrastructure projects no. or no. Uh, any kind of project. So I'd be very, very worried about that. What do you think's gone? What do you think's gone wrong with? The UK. Really? I don't think anything in particular has gone wrong. I, th I think the the there has been a, a, a there doesn't seem to have been an environment where businesses really feel comfortable investing for the long term. And uh, you know, obviously, the the run into Brexit and mm. the subsequent. I think companies are improving. They're they're beginning to live with the consequences of it, but. We've had volatility in terms of, you know, government mm. policy and U-turns. I think the a shrinking pool of capital in the UK and a shrinking investor base, because yeah. let's be honest, the traditional mm. investors in uh, equities and, and startup capital are immunizing their yeah. pension liabilities and they're not investing mm. in the real economy uh, so I think that's a massive disinvestment uh, sorry a disincentive so yeah. I, I just don't think that's a particularly healthy environment so I'm not surprised uh, the other thing I, I, I think is we have a history of innovating and basically selling that IP to too other, soon to, too yeah. soon and um, you know a company like arm you know that's the one that Good got away. Isn't it? One that got away, and that's that's not a great environment to encourage businesses to to invest. So I think that's uh, an unfortunate thing. So I, I think it's a combination of government policy, a lack of lack of consistent messaging, uh, and tinkering with yeah. you know tax yeah. breaks and things yeah. to encourage yeah. businesses to invest. But I think that the Brexit, I don't think, was handled, irrespective of what you feel aspirationally people that voted Leave wanted. Mm. I, and there are certain aspects that I have sympathy with, mm. but I don't think it was handled in anything like the way it should have been done. No. We could have got a better deal. Uh, we could have got some kind of deal, mm. some rapprochement that would have given us access to the largest market on our doorstep. Yeah. And talk about shooting yourself in, in the foot. So I think we're kind of picking ourselves up, dusting ourselves down, mm. uh, and I think that's that's put us back, you know, at least a decade. Yeah, um, we're going to have to go in again, aren't we, and try and negotiate? I I just or... don't think that's going to be an offer, yeah. and certainly not in the terms we had. So um, I I think that's not going to happen this generation. I'm afraid we're just going to have to learn to live with it and see mm. what kind of accommodation. Uh, we can come to and and as for signing up free trade deals with other countries, well, um, have we got one with Australia? I think. I think. Yeah, I think. <laughs> doesn't move. At all. I mean, it's 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 decimal points. You know, yeah. It's nothing meaningful. Yeah. It's yeah. nothing meaningful. Then the biggest market on your doorstep, four hundred million people, single currency. You know, I mean, seriously, mm. you couldn't make it up. No. Um, what was your best investing decision? My best investing decision. Um, QZ bought some Falkland oil and gas. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I actually, it, tactically, um, in, in terms of pick, picking a stock or whatever, I, I mean, I, 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 there's nothing that particularly, uh, I mean, I, I bought very early on uh, Renishaw when it, was, oh, yeah. when it was a small business. Cap, yeah. And I've just kept it ever since. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I always thought cool. by now, um, so David McMurtry would have retired and there was an opportunity that they were trying to sell the business, that it, they'll probably shuffle off and God knows what happens to it. But that again was, a, I, I, I remember I bought into that in the early 80s because um, I think Warbrooks were the brokers and I went on a company visit and um, the, the thing they made then was what was called a touch trigger probe. So mm. you put it on the end of a machine tool. And so it was smart technology in the UK, 
that was going into the most sophisticated machine tool yeah. companies in the world, which were based in Japan. I thought, well, there must be something yeah, about yeah. this. Yeah. This is a company to, to back. So that's mm. probably my best single investment. And tactically, uh, and it goes back to the kind of Brexit thing, mm. um, but just before we were looking for a hedge against it all going wrong, because even the night before, the expectation mm. was it would be vote remain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm. so I managed to persuade Duncan to put in an allocation to gold to our uh, our portfolios mm. as an asset allocation decision, not on the basis that the gold price would go up, but mm. or, uh, just just sterling just was sitting at 150. Yeah. And you knew that a bad outcome, the pound would collapse, which it duly did. It went from 150 mm. to 120. And so we made a huge windfall. Okay. So the gold price didn't move, but we mm. made a big currency. So that was yeah. tactically probably my smartest mm. recommendation, which we actually implemented. And then Jonathan would love to do it again. But. <laughs> I reckon the, the day after the referendum was one of the most kind of fulfilling days of my career. Mm -hmm. It's on my desk by six. Right. Because I've been mm. watching the referendum and you know heard the news at 4 a.m. and mm -hmm. it was mm. kind of eerie calm around the place. Yeah. But, you know, did a bit of dealing that morning, mm -hmm. phoned some clients, sent yeah. some emails out. Mm -hmm. I, you know, genuinely, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is the sort of stuff that we live for. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. <clears throat> and those sort of bad days. I mean, you know, along along the way, we've had quite a lot of bad days, right? We've mentioned Lehman Brothers, dot mm -hmm. com. There probably yeah. wasn't a specific day. Black Monday. Mm -hmm. it, do you sort of how would how should investors think about those rough patches and and what sort of I don't know hints and tips and tricks and what do they do? Just don't, yeah. don't look. Well, and forget the, about the, it. The, the graph tells it all. Um, you know, 40 years peppered with calamities mm. and the trajectory is still pretty obvious. So Bottom left, top right. Yeah, <laughs> I, and yeah. quite frankly, so the, the, I suppose we're probably drawing to the final mm. thing. You know, mm. you've got the active versus passive debate. You know, can you actually outperform markets? And this is an interesting. I still think you can because mm. that philosophically, despite my full power day one <laughs> saying, like a hey, uh, you're, you're, <laughs> markets are efficient why are we wasting our time here um there's the door yeah <laughs> so okay i was only joking on us um i think it's getting harder um passives now have overtaken active in terms mm. of proportion of mm. money invested so momentum is becoming a bigger driver of markets because people are agnostic about stock prices is yeah. just direction if you're <laughs> investing in a tracker um, I think the way you make money, and it's always been the way I've looked at running money, is rather than focusing on trying to find the next winner, mm. focus more on the things that you think are at risk, weeding out the things. And the, the reason active managers consistently underperform benchmarks is that the human nature is to back the underdog the, the companies that are suffering because you think they'll eventually yeah. recover. Yeah, mean reversion. And you don't own it. enough of the good stuff. Yeah. And you own too much of the things that you hope will recover. Mm. You may have suffered the big profit warning, mm. um, in which case you should ask yourself, should I have seen that coming? Did I do enough work yeah. Yeah. on the quality of this business, the competition, mm. the whatever? And I think the way you outperform is actually trying to avoid the big profit warning because yeah. it could take yeah, years sure. to recover from yeah. that. Um, because yeah. the, the dynamics of the market are not going to change. Passive is cheap. You get the market return. When you're hearing month in, month out that you know less than 20% of active managers are outperforming. Mm. But they're not, they're not doing it consistently. The same ones are not doing it every year no. for 10 years. Yeah. And, and so you've either got to cherry pick your managers and hope that they are doing the best job they can for you, but you don't really have control over that. No. Um, but, you mm. know, there are some that are doing it. Um, the, the, I'm not saying that's not a, a good plan, but when it comes to direct equity investment where you've got slightly more control, yeah. um, I'd focus more time on things that potentially could damage yeah. my portfolio yeah. rather than trying to pick the next 10 bagger. Uh, but you should obviously try and identify good businesses. Mm. But I think probably spend more time on the things that could hurt. 
I think yeah, a- avoiding mistakes. Avoiding mistakes is yeah. definitely, mm. and, it, and it's a sort of almost like a kind of negative mindset, isn't it? I'm just going to avoid being wrong. Yes, yeah. it doesn't feel like a rather than I'm going to go and find something good. Yeah, I, and the reason you'll never consistently <coughs> outperform the index, I hate to say, it, is because there's a natural survivor bias in indices. Yeah. You know, weak companies go bust, they disappear. Yeah. And, you know, you are, if you're owning them, uh, or they, be, they become smaller in the index. Mm. Um, so if you're buying into a passive, you're, you're buying that crap stock in a much smaller proportion than it was. Yeah. Whereas yeah. active managers will tend to load up. <laughs> on, the, on the assumption, yeah. rightly or wrongly, that mm. eventually it will recover and mm. they'll get more than their money back. And that, sadly, doesn't happen very often. Mm. So, and then sort of allied to that, now we have, um, um, <clears throat> as far as the demographic of the pod goes, we have quite a lot of sort of students, literally mm-hmm. students, yeah. people coming into the yeah. industry. I and mean, what would you sort of mm. suggest other than don't buy the rubbish? Well, if you want to succeed in this business, you have to have a natural curiosity about the world around you. You've got to behave like a sponge. You just really want to absorb lots of information. And I don't mean financial market information. You just should have a curiosity about the world around you because that will inform you about a lot of things that even on the day may not register, but mm. it will make you a more rounded individual. And if you want to be a generalist, a portfolio manager, you need to know a lot. I, I, and I, I don't buy into knowing a little about a lot of things is a dangerous thing. You're not trying to be a specialist pretending you know a lot about stuff but knowing a little bit a lot, a lot of things mm. gives you context yeah I agree and it, it it avoids you becoming siloed and brainwashed and blind and all this kind of yeah i think that's such an important um but you, you know you have yeah. to be interested in i don't know um anthropology you've got to be interested in human astronomy. behavior mm. astronomy prog rock, prog rock. Any, anything just be interested, be curious. Mm, yeah. And um, as I say, that's, I, and genuinely want to learn. Yeah, you asking know, good questions is sort of allied to that. Can't it? be mm. complete, and asking good questions, yeah. Uh, the, the, the old adage, there's, the, there's no such thing as a stupid question, just a stupid answer. Mm. Uh, mm. So never be afraid to ask, never be afraid to say, sorry, I really didn't understand that. Mm. I, and that was one of the things one of my bosses taught me early on. He said, you go to lunch presentations, you feel a bit bamboozled by, you know, these very um, well-dressed, <laughs> um, articulate people who think they know what they're talking about. If you don't understand what they're saying, just put your hand up and say, I'm mm. sorry, could you just go through that again? And I think the most important really thing with that is if you're asking that question, probably 80% mm. of the room would quite like to ask the question. Oh, they're, they're so relieved you asked it's, it oh, on 100%. Behalf. And is everyone oh, yeah. nods and smiles and almost yeah, says, oh, thank goodness for that. I know. Um, and, and again, you've just got to be a little bit kind of confident enough to yeah. not feel shy and retiring. Mm. Uh, but no, I think the mm. what I think about markets now is that we've got proper price discovery. We've got you know um, a discount rate that is a real one and not a fictitious yeah. kind yeah. of zero so you can see how capital should be allocated and that gives be- better pricing across all asset classes yeah, agreed and to me that is the best opportunity we've seen in the last 10 15 years mm. where everyone was kind of forced into equities mm. because it really was about the only thing yeah you know you could actually uh, invest in with a, a, a growth potential because it's been very liberating else. with clients yeah, yeah I, I just say it, the, the the pain of getting there has been excruciating. Yeah. But start mm. if you're starting a new client with cash with a reasonable time horizon, seven years plus, mm. you know, you, you there's so much offerings and value in every asset class. Mm. I think, mm. I totally think agree. it's a great time to start investing. Yeah, yeah, really no, good. agreed. And then what does uh, what does the next stage look like for you? Then what have you got planned? Uh, so immediately, I'm going to decompress for a little while. Um, probably go off to Austria for a few weeks after mm. Easter. Uh, I've got a novel to write. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I want to learn to play the piano. Uh, and then I'm probably going to think about doing something kind of more community based. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just kind of. Do a bit, but uh, my wife runs a charity, and so she gets a lot mm. of involved in a lot of community projects. And mm. So I think I'd rather do something like that than become a consultant or a, sure. an advisor to a charity investment committee. Because 
it's just the same thing yeah, again. You know, yeah. what, what's the point? Talking I've, about the relative merits of the uh, US against yeah, I mean, the I've spent market. 42 mm, years yeah. pushing that particular barrel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think it's about time to focus my energy elsewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. No, well, thank you. Well, thank you on behalf of James and I and the pod for your no, my, time my and pleasure. Yeah, no, it's, it's been time fun and actually today. scratching back through yeah. my memory. Yeah. Uh, as to all the big events. Yeah. And, uh, wow. And thank I'm you amazed I'm still here. <laughs> Well, well, thank, thank you on behalf of the firm for all of no, that. No, I was going to say for your years. guidance. And yeah, no. it's been invaluable, it really has been. No, I'm yeah. delighted to have been, been a, part of it all. It's been a pleasure working with you. So. Thank you. Um, on that note, mm -hmm. Alan, thank you. Uh, any questions on any of uh, what we've talked about today, get in touch. James.Hughes at quarterchievit.com. Uh, I'm Jonathan.Raymond at quarterchievit.com. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed today and we mm -hmm. hope to see you soon. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you.